Greetings ladies and gentlemen, this is Dmitry Balkovsky of the Reactionary Blog and I'm introducing to you today my interview with uh, Hugo Salinas Price, the world's leading expert on gold and silver monetization, a prolific author, a philosopher and the president of uh, Mexican Civic Association Pro Silver. I will tell you that this is not a typical gold bug interview even though I ask typical gold bug questions. The usual scenario for such an interview is this. You get suggestions on buying physical metal and augmenting your physical metals portfolio with uh, stocks of gold and silver producers and junior explorers. So do not expect a specific investment advice in this interview, but there is something that is, in my opinion, much more valuable and, and much rarer in our days and very much needed too. Mr. Salinas gives us uh, philosophical reasons for saving in precious metals, gives us historical background and he bases his uh, insights on his huge experience and his wisdom for he is known as the sage of Mexico. Today he is the world's leading authority on all matters precious, gold and silver related. Here is interview, uh, the questions and answers were pre-recorded, so there is a bit of a, uh, an air of artificiality to it, but we decided to do it this way for the sake of convenience. But I think everything is clear and audible, so here we go. I will be reading out the questions and f uh, they will be followed by uh, Mr. Salinas' answers. Hello, Dimitri. It's good to be with you. I think this is a, a historic cooperation between two individuals. One in great Russia and its capital Moscow and here in Mexico City, Mexico, myself, Hugo, to a private individual and we have a, can have a very interesting conversation on uh, our lives and our circumstances and what we see is happening and what is going on in the world and I think this is a an important precedent of cooperation between two private individuals and I hope it's of interest to your viewers and to other viewers and other places who may be interested in this uh, in this event which I think is unique and I'm very pleased to be with you and to and to uh, respond to you whatever questions you may have. Mr. Salinas, uh, what is your view on the near-term prospects for the price of gold and what is the probability that it will reach uh, that magical notch of 1400 by the end of this year? Dimitri, with regard to gold, well nobody knows but as for 1400 as a objective by year end, I think that's quite feasible. I think that gold is behaving very uh, unusually since uh, Mr. Powell of the Federal Reserve seemed to cave in on his uh, measures to contract uh, the volume of credit extended by the Fed and uh, that has given a sudden boost to gold and I think that the price of gold will continue to rise. I follow uh, Kitco.com every day very closely and I notice on the graph today at midday here in Mexico City that already the forces of intervention in the gold market are active as evidenced by the swift falls from uh, 1522 to 1516 or something like that, five dollars, five dollars or so in a vertical fashion. Now these falls in price in a vertical, in a vertical falls, for me are evidence of intervention because this is not typical of a, of a <clears throat> individuals in the gold market. This is not the way they act. This is a, an intervention. I I think the the monetary authorities are quite concerned that the price of gold may uh, suddenly get out of hand, which would be very inconvenient. 
for the US dollar, of course. You have recently published two open letters to President Trump regarding silver monetization in the United States. Have you received any feedback, positive, negative? Have you heard anything at all? No, Dmitry. Uh, absolute silence with regard to uh, my message to, for Mr. Trump, which I believe would be uh, very helpful to him. I think that monetizing the Silver Eagle, you know that Americans have purchased uh, 520 million ounces of Silver Eagle coins since 1986 to date. These Americans would be so happy to see their, their coins turned into money. It would be a spectacular move on the part of Mr. Trump which I think would absolutely seal his re-election. Now, Mr. Trump is a, an intriguing figure. He has done things which I do not think are positive for the present system. But on the other hand, I think that if he destroys the present dollar system, it would be good for the world because it's an artificial system has done a lot of damage. By destroying the dollar system, which he seems to intent on doing by alienating his allies and hurling um, uh, sanctions right and left. Well, he's, he's destroying the dollar system because the dollar system relies on the, on the fact that the United States has to run a permanent trade deficit in order to send dollars abroad. These dollars make up the reserves of the central banks of the world. And if the central banks of the world cannot have, have dollars, well then there is no dollar system. Uh, the dollar system collapses. So he's doing his best to collapse the dollar system. I think that for the world that might be a, a positive step. Uh, we'd have to go back to something more fundamental. So much for the United States and uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, perhaps my message will eventually get to him, though. I don't know. It might be. What is the probable scenario for the oncoming financial crisis? What gives first? China, the United States, Italy, or somewhere else? Uh, your thoughts on this? Well, Dimitri, I really have no, no answer to give you. I don't know what is going to happen, but certainly we are in a very unstable world. Uh, it, uh, we, see, uh, we see disturbing news every day of problems. And so the world is now in a state of flux, in my opinion. Things are changing very rapidly. And I'm pleased to know that Russia has from what from the news that I have that Russia has consolidated its economy, has been buying gold, very good, and is it, Russia is a is an important gold producer. It's increasing its reserves, and gold is the only real world money, and it will have to come back sooner or later. And what is your view of the? situation in Mexico and Latin America as a whole and what would be an ideal path that you would like your region to follow? Well, Dimitri, that's a very big question. The future of Mexico. You know, we are neighbors of the United States and that has been our, our misfortune, really. Mexico was a, an enormously prosperous country in the beginning of the 19th century enormously prosperous. We had the trade with, with China, which had been going on for 300 years. The first ship to leave Mexico went to China with silver in 1534. 1534. And Spanish galleon floated across the Pacific from uh, Mexico to the Philippines, and there the Chinese merchants 
were delighted to see that uh, the galleon brought silver, which they really wanted. The Europeans had come from, from the West, but they had not taken to China anything that the Chinese were interested in. So for the Chinese emperor at the time said that the, the, he was not interested in trade with Europe because Europe didn't have anything that was interesting for China. China had everything they needed and, and uh, Europe had nothing to offer them that was of interest. But when the Mexican galleon arrived with silver, that they were interested in. And so the, that was the beginning of the trade. The, the uh, man in charge of that expedition was Urdaneta. That was his name, a Spaniard. And he had to find a way to get back to Mexico because he couldn't go back the same way he came. The current and the, and the winds were contrary. So he devised to go up uh, near Japan and up to the Aleutians uh, uh, near Alaska and he finally made a landing on North America at a cape which he named Cape Mendocino in honor of the Spanish Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza he called the Cape, cape Mendocino and from there he sailed down with the current uh, flowing down the uh, western coast of North America and sailed back to Acapulco and that was the beginning of the trade of Mexico with China which turned Mexico into a, an immensely prosperous country shipping loads of silver to Manila and returning with all sorts of precious uh, goods from China some of which stayed in Mexico and others were on transshipped on to Europe from uh, the port of Veracruz on the Gulf. So that was Mexico in the early 19, up to the early 19th century when uh, unfortunately our northern neighbor became uh, ambitious and uh, the story of Mexico since then has been one of receiving continual aggression. Finally uh, we lost uh, a war to the United States in 1847 where they took off half of our territory and to the present well we we have cooperated in recent years with a with a with a, uh, a trade treaty which uh, Mr. Trump uh, destroyed but now he's uh, apparently willing to uh, re-establish and we shall see what happens to us because our trade with the United States is uh, most of our foreign trade is with the United States and very important to us. And uh, now we have uh, our president taking an independent stance with regard to Venezuela and saying, well, uh, the rules are of non-intervention. Let's let the Venezuelans sort their own problems out. Well, of course, uh, Mr. Trump in Washington, D.C. doesn't like that at all. And we'll have to see what happens here. I don't think it's going to be nice. We shall see. At our last meeting in July 2017, at the uh, Silver Peso conference, which took place in the Russian embassy in Mexico City, you told me that you boycotted this very embassy, this very building, in 1956 because of the Soviet invasion of Hungary and you said that the building was completely darkened and you were standing outside and now you can see the Russia one of the last hopes of Christendom so what do you think of such a tremendous change well Dimitri I think the change is nothing so short of miraculous who could have expected this I mean it's entirely uh, an unexpected event uh, and uh, I think it's a, a, an admirable event and I think that Russia is perhaps the only Christian country officially Christian country in the world today nobody else wants to be a Christian country they all want to be uh, nothing they all want to be in favor of uh, prosperity and that's the only thing that is interesting and not the spiritual 
aspect, which I think is absolutely fundamental. Because if people do not have some sort of hope, well then you have a formula for disorder. And Christianity has provided over the centuries humanity with hope. Hope of a blessed life after death. And this is very, very important. Because, you see, I have come to the conclusion in recent recent times that human life is really exists in, a, in an unalterable condition. Human life cannot be altered. We cannot have a, a human life that is free of pain and suffering. It is part of life. And the ancients recognized this and uh, never questioned it. And Christ came along and gave the world hope. That is the message of Christ, hope. And that was the basis of Western civilization up until the Renaissance and sometime after that. The, with the Renaissance came uh, books which put people to th reading and thinking and to experimentation and to interest in the natural world and physics. And by the time of the French Revolution, there was so much great optimism among the thinkers that society could really be changed so that things would be better and everybody would be better off than under monarchy. And so they had the, the French Revolution and uh, decapitated the king and the queen. And shortly thereafter, we have Karl Marx coming along with his plans for a perfect society, which would involve, unfortunately, the extermination of businessmen like myself and, a, uh, and the takeover of the, of the workers, uh, the, both agricultural and industrial. And this would be the perfect society which would evolve for, through socialism finally into communism, which would be a perfect society. Well, uh, didn't work out that way because there cannot be a society which is perfectly free of suffering. And our world today does not want to recognize that. Every single country in the world today is working uh, under governments which plan uh, or attempt to improve everything so that nobody will suffer. And this is an absolutely impossible objective. And this is our world today. We are living a nightmare of trying to make a dream come true. It's impossible. We cannot have a society where suffering is eliminated. I'm sorry to say. This is part of life. But humanity today doesn't want to recognize that. This is a great problem. How are we going to get back to a realization that the best we can do is to attenuate suffering by peaceful cooperation in working and producing and trading, preventing the abuse, uh, or, uh, uh, the abuse of one group over another and with equal rules for everybody that whereby through production and cooperation we can reach a better state, not a perfect state, but a perfect state. And that is all we can hope for. That is why I'm, I'm for free trade, private enterprise, private property, the family, and a religious belief in their eighth life thereafter. Dimitri, Mr. Salinas, we know that you like to reflect on history. Who are the three historical figures you admire the most? Well, Dimitri, that's a very difficult question. But thinking it over, or just offhand, of course, the most important historical figure for our civilization 
the West is Christ. And after Christ, whose message was, as I understand, principally to the Jews, we have St. Paul, who took the message of Christ and amplified it to make it apply to all humans. So that puts him in the second place. And then after that, perhaps the figure of Constantine. Constantine, you know, the Roman emperor, who lived up until, I think, 327 of the Christian calendar. He was born in York, Eboracum, as it was called in Roman times, in England. He was an Englishman before England existed, but he was born in Britain. And I think that he was probably already a Christian, because from what I have read recently, <clears throat> England was really the first Christianized country in the world. This is not generally known or accepted, but the Church, the Catholic Church, has accepted this in certain councils to give precedence to the Church, the Roman Catholic Church of England, as the first Christian Church to come into existence. And so when Constantine came to Rome to dethrone, dethrone the, the uh, present emperor, and raised the standard of a cross at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. I think that the most of the of the population of Rome was already Christian, and that's how he triumphed. And afterwards, his influence in uh, permitting the Christian religion to figure legally among the different religions that prevailed in the Roman Empire was a very important figure. So I'd, I'd say Christ, St. Paul, and Constantine. Christ without question, and the others as assistants in the process of Christianization, of which Russia is now the last remaining outpost of Christianity. Mr. Salinas, you have been at the forefront of the global fight for sound money for the past 30 years. It has been a noble heart, but in many ways thanked to struggle. What started you on this path? What was your motivation? Would you choose to go the same way if you could turn back time? Yes, certainly. It's been a, a very interesting occupation for me. You know, I was general manager of, of uh, my company, which is called Electra, from its foundation practically. When I started at the age of 20 at this company, uh, without knowing anything about management at all, but just with the uh, intention of doing a job the best I could. Well. Somehow I survived, and in 1988, well, I had a, my eldest son uh, came into the company, and I realized that uh, he came to the company earlier, he came into the company eight years before, in 80. But by 1988, I realized that he was much more capable than I was, and much more interested in business than I. So I, I abdicated, I fired myself, and it was the best thing I could have done because my son has taken over the business and turned it into a, a very large enterprise, very important now in the country. And he's very, he's a, my son is a very able man, and much more practical than I am. And so I have lots of time to think, and that's how I, <clears throat> I've always been interested in, in gold for savings. I began to save gold when I was 10 years old. I'll tell you the anecdote. I had been with my father at his, his store. He ran a store downtown Mexico City. And uh, on the way home with him one evening, he pulled out of his coat 
this jacket a lottery ticket and he told me well this lottery ticket didn't win a prize but it won a refund and the refund is a hundred pesos and I'll give you the hundred pesos what would you do with a hundred pesos so I said buy me some gold coins and so he bought me ten tiny little gold coins of two pesos each the peso the gold peso was worth at that time five paper pesos we had just begun inflation you see that was in, that was in about 1945 i guess so he bought me these these uh, 10 tiny little coins which i treasured over the years and i still have those coins so i'm a gold bug from way back my grandfather was also a a a gold bug in a way because when he saw that there was a problem of revolution brewing in 1910 he had acquired gold coins which he put away in his house and when his factory was burnt down he used those gold coins to rebuild his factory so uh, these things come down in the family and perhaps uh, that has been the influence that put me on the path now with regard to silver Silver was always the money of Mexico, not, not gold. Here I can mention to you that the United States in the early 1900s sent financial missionaries to the world, especially to Latin America, to put them on gold standard. We were on a silver standard. But our uh, Secretary of the Treasury at that time uh, accepted the persuasions of the financial missionary of the time uh, back in 1910 and we had a, a, uh, a reform where gold and silver uh, both were to circulate together well, that was doomed to failure doomed to failure and it caused a great uh, deal of problems because silver the value between silver and gold cannot be fixed at, at a certain ratio and that and uh, the measures taken by uh, our financial uh, treasurer of the country fixed a ratio it was doomed to failure and this is one of the causes of the Mexican Revolution of 1910 because of the of the pain that this measure caused upon the agricultural sector of Mexico, which at that time was very, very important, and very a basis of the, our prosperity. So that's part of our history. And I think that <clears throat> we should, in, in the face of inflation, I think that it would be a very beneficent measure if our government would give us silver money as a means of savings by means of a quoted value for the silver coin not a stamped value the quoted value could be raised as the silver price rises instead of as it has always done when the price of silver rose all the silver coinage went out of circulation it probably happened in Russia too and so I have proposed this and I have proposed this to Russia I've proposed it to your great president, whom I admire enormously, Vladimir Putin. I've recently attempted to, to persuade Mr. Trump by means of a message. I've spoken to our president of Mexico also, but find little echo. Now I don't understand why governments do not wish to see satisfaction and uh, peace of mind among their populations. Why are they reluctant? With that, uh, Dimitri, with that consideration of why governments do not think it important to have satisfied and uh, peaceful uh, populations happy to be able to save and look to the future with confidence because they have silver money which is not going to devalue. 
I leave you with a question, Dimitri, and I hope we can continue these conversations, which I think can be very fruitful to uh, a better understanding of Russia regarding our country, and uh, for others who may see this interview in the United States, perhaps will also be uh, find some echo and some positive response. Goodbye, Dmitri. Nice talking with you. Well, this is it, dear colleagues and viewers. Let me thank uh, Mr. Salinas for his kind replies and uh, I'm positive that this small interview will uh, do you good, will open your eyes to some aspects of, the, of our cause, uh, which were not as clear to you before as they are now. So, thank you very much and this was Dmitry Belkovsky.